today we are going to speak about fascicular ventricular tachycardia. So why fascicular ventricular tachycardia? So we will try to make this session a little bit more interactive as well and I would like to have continuous feedback from our students who are attending this session as well. Okay, Because as I have already said, it, there will be questions at the end of the session which will be put up and you all will have to answer and you all are going to be scored on the basis of that. Okay, so now coming to the fascicular VT. So I think you all are, how many people have come across such cases, fascicular VT? So what do you see on ECG actually? Okay, I'll try to give you a little bit of theoretical background. So this is also called as Belhazen ventricular tachycardia. It was named after the scientist uh, who saw that there's a special morphology of tachycardia which is sensitive to verapamil. And in fact, what happens is it tends to get activated anterogradely during tachycardia and the fast conduction Purkinje fibers get activated retrogradely during the tachycardia. And these are the ones which is recorded as a two potentials, different potentials. One is in front of the Purkinje potential, so something is called as pre-Purkinje and the other one of course is Purkinje potentials. So if you will be asking those people who are having this kind of problem, they will be telling that most of the times they are male and in, they are in the age group of uh, when they will be doing mostly exercise in, in the times like they are pretty young and yes whenever they take a calcium channel blocker so it tends to terminate as well and that is where there is a big role again for the catheter ablation so if you are able to ablate them so you are going to see that almost up to 95% of the times you will be able to take care of the tachycardia so there are three different types of the tachycardia on the basis of the morphology so one is called as the left-sided anterior fascicular tachycardia, left posterior and upper septal. So on the, how do you differentiate them on the basis of ECG? So most common, of course, is the left posterior. So the left posterior, what happens is, on the ECG, you will be seeing is the, especially if you will be seeing on the chest leads, it will be RBBB pattern. However, with left axis deviation. Otherwise, for the left anterior fascicular VT, it will be opposite axis. Opposite axis means right middle branch block with right axis deviation. So this is the hallmark for the anterior fascicular VT. However, for the upper septal fascicular VT, the axis is going to be normal. But as we all are aware of the fascicular VTs, they are, they are characteristically pretty narrow QRS. Kamrul, can you mute your microphone? Kamrul Islam, please mute your microphone. I can hear a lot of noise. Yes, yes. Please mute your microphone or disconnect it. So now coming to the EP characteristics. So what happens inside the heart? What is the problem which is happening for the ECCG? So normally for the ventricular tachycardias, uh, the ones which are having an origin from the ventricles, most commonly we try to do something that's called as ventricular stimulation. However, this is the one which you may be able to induce even with atrial stimulation. So this is the fascicular VT, it is going to fascinate you, literally. Okay. So these are some of the things that even with atrial stimulation, you may be able to stimulate it, okay? You may be able to induce it. Similarly, other thing as well is, sometimes, even if you are using um, adenosine, sometimes I'm telling, not always, but rarely you may be able to see it, might be able to even terminate it as well. And in fact, what happens is, up to 25% of the times, such patients may be having an other tachycardia as well. Other tachycardia, what is the tachycardia they tend to have is a supraventricular tachycardia. It means it's something like a, 
uh, AVRT they may be having or they may be even have or they may be even having a AV nodal re-entry tachycardia or access free pathway mediated tachycardia. So these are different tachycardias a patient can have. So it's not like this if you just ablate one of them and then that, oh yes, you are done, no ways. So you will have to be really careful. As I said it, so they, they can be different, different types of tachycardias as well for that. So, so I was talking to you about those potentials, which we can see, especially if you go inside the heart, especially during the procedure. So this is how it looks like. So as I was telling you, so the Purkinje potential. So they are very distinct from the A and V, which we, we, one may be able to see. So for example, if the your catheter is going to be there in the ventricle, in that area, I'm going to talk more in detail. So just before the V, you'll start to see two different kind of potentials. So one is going to be very sharp, okay? And the other one is going to be very dull. So the potential which is very sharp is the one which is called as pre purkinje or Purkinje potentials, PP. The one which is before the Purkinje potentials, it is called as triple P. Triple P means pre purkinje potential. So PP and triple P. So that's what you notice. Okay. So this one is very sharp and the other one is very dull over here. So uh, the triple P was initially described by uh, a, a famous Japanese, I would say, clinician and uh, who saw it like, and he showed it that it tends to represent the excitation of the entrance of the specialized zone in the ventricular septum and it tends to have decremental property and it's also sensitive to verapamil. Okay, decremental property in the sense so whenever we are trying to do continuous stimulation, so it will start increasing. So for example, when we are trying to pace at a higher cycle length or like we are pacing at a quicker speed, it will start increasing in the cycle length, okay? So that is what is called as hmm, uh, decremental property. In fact, and as I already said it to you, this is comparatively dull. And the frequency is really low. And as I already said it, and that's why it is called as triple P, because it is in front of the PP, which is Purkinje potential. And I am talking about this during the tachycardia, right? So now coming to the PP, which I was talking about. So the PP, which I, as I already said it, it was again described by a Japanese doctor, which is called as Dr. Nakagawa, and which tends to show the activation of the left posterior fascicle, or which is close to the Purkinje fibers near the left posterior fascicle, okay? And as I had already said it, this also again tends to be before the QRS, okay, during the tachycardia, and this is very sharp, very brief, and high frequency potential in fact. So this is, so we are always curious to know, hmm, okay, since we know about it, what about its significance? What is its significance actually? Where is it located? So what happens is, especially when the tachycardia is going on, the anterograde limb of the circuit tends to proceed through the specialized verapamil sensitive zone from the basal to the apical in the LV septum. And that is the one which causes triple P, okay? Don't forget, as I was telling you. So what happens is, there are two, uh, okay, I'll try to show you the diagram. So the, if you will be able to see, this diagram is very conceptual, very important. So in the sense, what happens is, so this is the tachycardia, uh, but in a very slow speed, uh, which is showing. So if you'll be able to notice, this is a typical left ventricle. And so these are the different areas in the left ventricle. So these are the coronary cusps. This is the non-coronary sinus. And this is the bundle, left bundle branch. Okay. And this is the one which is the anterior fascicle. And this is the posterior fascicle. 
And the area where we see the earliest triple P is over here. So as I was telling you, the broad, dull potential over here. And the earliest Purkinje potential which we see it is over here. Okay? And this is what is called as the myocardial exit site. So once you are able to understand, so as I was telling you, so this is the classical area of slow conduction. So it is close to the bundle branch. So in the sense, if someone is not careful about keeping their catheter, one may be able to induce even a block as well, bundle branch block in fact. So that's why it is very, very important as well. Okay. Uh, so, now coming to the concept, what is happening over here? So what is happening is, over here, as I was telling you, uh, that during the ventricular tachycardia, the an anti-grade limb of the circuit proceeds through the specialized verapamil sensitive zone from the basal to the apical site of the LV septum, which gives rise to the pre potential. Therefore, the earliest pre potential is seen in the basal septum and the latest pre is seen in the apical septum. And in fact, the re circuit of the fascicular VT is completed by a zone of slow conduction, which is there between the pre and pre a PP areas in the basal interventricular septum. Okay, The slow conduction zone, which is this upper turn, a round point of the circuit is located close to the main trunk of the left bundle branch block. So as we can see it over here, yeah. So as I said it, it should be there in, a, in the permanent memory of our brain if we want to understand what is literally fascicular VT actually. So as I said it, the anterior grade limb of the circuit will be proceeding through the verapamil sensitive zone the curve line from the base to the apical LV septum, which is giving rise to the triple P, which I said it, pre purkinje potential, as seen in the accompanying electrogram, which we can see it in the uh, lower portion of the figure. And the lower turnaround site of the re circuit occurs in the lower third of the septum with the capture of the fast conduction Purkinje fibers along the posterior fascicle. And from here, the anti-grid activation occurs down the septum to break through the septal myocardium below and the retrograde activation occurs over the posterior fascicle from apical to basal septum forming the retrograde limb of the tachycardia. In fact, the re circuit is completed by a zone of slow conduction. That is the, always the target zone for the ablation in fact at the upper turnaround point of the circuit, which is located close to the main trunk of the left bundle branch, which I already said it, right? So, if you come across the ECG, what will be the differential diagnosis for a fascicular VT? Would anyone like to comment? So, you all can use the chat box. See, I, I want some answers as well from the students, okay? And we are having so many students uh, attending, see, we are having so many of people. So tell me, so you can use the chat box, what is the differential diagnosis? If you come across the ECG, okay, so first thing we might think, okay, this is a fascicular VT. What are the other things which we may be able to see? So VT, you know the characteristic things, most, of the, most commonly it is wider, but as I said, fascicular VTs tend to be a little bit narrower. So VT characteristic things are going to be there definitely, okay? The axis may be supporting, you already know, uh, the VA dissociation may be there. But these things are there. But what is the other differential diagnosis which you all will be able to think? Hmm. No one is writing anything. <laughs> okay, so about the differential diagnosis, as I said, this is more of a narrow QRS tachycardia. So the narrow QRS tachycardia, what else do you see? So you may be able to see, so for example, if there is a SVT supraventricular tachycardia with aberrancy, okay? As I said, narrow QRS tachycardia. 
And yes, if something is it is responsive to intravenous verapamil, and then that will be important differential diagnosis, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of times you may be able to see something is called as AVRTs, AVRTs in young patients, and which will be which may sometimes respond, of course, to the calcium channel blocker as well. So that is an imp important differential diagnosis, which you all should be able to keep it in mind whenever we come across a patient like this. So then, so what do you do if you have already come across this, like, okay, this is the problem. So what you do is go to that area, try to do an entrainment that, yes, this is, you are in the circuit. So then you will uh, start exploring the LV area. Where I was telling is, you will start searching for the Purkinje potential. Preceding the onset of QRS, during tachycardia in an area over like two to three centimeters square in the posterior half of the LV septum. In one third to one fourth of the distance from apex to base. Okay, so you have to start searching for the potentials actually. But as I said it, from the apex to the base, no. Okay, in that area, in the posterior half, you will be seeing in the lower one third to one fourth area in fact lower 25 percent you can think it like this but in the posterior half and you will be able to notice only in the area of like two to three centimeters square over there what will happen is when as i already said it you will be able to entrain it well and entrain just not that sometimes yes you will be able to see concealed fusion as well and if you will be doing post pacing interval minus tachycardia cycle length it should not be more than 30 second, milliseconds. So, of course, you are there in the circuit. And in fact, what is going to happen is within a small area, which is proximal to the earliest Purkinje potential recording site, is activated from the base to the apex towards the earliest Purkinje potential site. And if you are going to notice carefully the interval between the pre Purkinje potential at the site of successful ablation, and the onset of QRS complex during VT is approximately like 60 plus minus 30 milliseconds in fact. And yes, if you have ablated it well enough, the pre Purkinje potential tends to appear after the QRS complex during the sinus rhythm. So a lot of people will be asking like, uh, there is some uh, research as well which is going on like which sites to ablate. So then it is said like this is the better site for ablation is yes you just need to give like fewer applications are needed in the places wherever you are trying to target is the Purkinje potentials compared to the pre Purkinje okay and in fact like up to around 5 to uh, plus minus 2 more applications if you will give most of times you will be able to ablate them well. So sometimes uh, the tachycardia induction may be difficult. So what you do is you try to ablate it during the sinus rhythm. As you guess if the patient is very symptomatic during the tachycardia or you are, you are not able to do so that is the time you will be focusing like okay let's try to ablate it during the sinus rhythm itself. So then what you do is, during the sinus rhythm, yes, uh, a, pace, a perfect pace map is not always uh, recommended. This is a little bit exception in the sense you need not have 12 out of 12 pace mapping in the sense that uh, whenever you are pacing from the successful site of ablations, even up to like 10 plus minus 2 uh, is also pretty good out of the 12 leads in fact so as I said it so even if up to like 7 or 8 if you are able to uh, um, the pace map is matching you can go ahead with the ablation in fact so need not worry so even with the 2D as well 2 dimensional ablation you will be able to take care of it however if you have done the ablation and it becomes a little bit difficult so that is the time you may consider for the 3D mapping. But in the 3D mapping, so you should you try to uh, tag 
the important areas. Important areas in the sense, the his bundle area, the left bundle branch block area, the fascicles. Okay, and you have to tag it. And then you try to put up a linear lesion, which is perpendicular to the wave front propagation direction of the po left posterior fascicle, which is nearly one centimeter above the sinus breakout point. And the linear lesion is midway between the apex and the base of the septum. Okay, and of course, those are the areas where Purkinje potentials are going to be present. So, uh, this was one of the cases uh, which was done, and you can see it over here. So, what do you notice over here? So, the anterior fascicle area has been marked, the posterior fascicle area has been marked, the left a bundle branch has been marked as well, the his area as well, and even the right sided right bundle branch has been marked as well. And finally, a line was drawn as I was telling you a perpendicular line across this where the PP was seen, in fact. So, as you can see it here, if you look carefully, so now one question comes to you guys. The ECG which is there on the other this side of the screen, is it sinus rhythm or is it tachycardia? Anyone would like to answer what is happening over here? Hello. Yeah. No, 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 there's no problem. I'm asking question to our students. No, 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 not, not for you. So what do you see? So no problem. So the question, did you, I hope you understand. So the ECG which you are seeing over here, is it a tachycardia ECG? Or is it a sinus rhythm ECG? I already gave you a lot of hints as well. A lot of answers I have already given to you. So what do you notice over here? The pre purkinje potential is coming in the end, right? It is not coming in the front. Oh, and what did I say? So normally during the tachycardia, the pre purkinje is going to be coming in the front of the purkinje. So that's why it is called as pre purkinje, right? So this is a sinus rhythm ECG. Okay, anyways. So when do you call that okay we have done everything and all so what happens is um, so what is called is the end point whenever you are doing so you will be able to notice the significant shift of the qrs axis so the right axis may be formed uh, there may be deep q waves as well in the inferior leads similarly deep s waves in the lateral leads may be seen without morphology of the real left uh, Sh Dr. Shayad Ashraf, you should not ask for annotation, okay? So I'm going to decline the request. Okay, so you may be able to see even the deep S wave in the lateral leads without the morphology of the real left posterior fascicular block. So like anything as well, uh, even when you're trying to treat invasively such kind of tachycardias, complications may be seen. So, for example, uh, if you are able to do a successful ablation, of course, the amplitude of the local myocardium will be diminished and the Purkinje potential tends to appear after the myocardial potential, which I already showed it to you. A lot of times, left bundle branch block may be seen. Otherwise, maybe sometimes even AV block, if you are close to the his area, in fact. So, because a lot of times, sometimes someone may be getting confused with the his potential as well. So that is where AV block may happen, even left bundle branch block may happen because if someone has already ablated the left bundle branch as well. So the best thing is of course, yes, uh, when VT is difficult to induce, yes. However, we must remember the recurrence rate is pretty high. In fact, one third of those ablations for this may recur. One third means, for, for example, up to 35%. So out of three ablations, if you do, 
one may recur back, in fact. So I will try to show you some examples. So now I am going to wait for your answers and I will be going very, very slowly, step by step approach. So what happens? So this is a ECG of a 25 year old male patient who comes to you in the emergency medicine, in the emer emergency area. Okay, so you are called in in the emergency. Where is the cardiologist? On call. Rukshana, can you mute your microphone? Rukshana, Dr. Rukshana, please mute your microphone. Hmm. So, if you are called up to the emergency room with such a ECG of the young male patient. So, what do you think on seeing this ECG? Dr. Ambu Patoli. Ambuyu Patoli. Please mute your microphone. Whenever you are talking to someone else and all, at least mute your microphone. There are other people who are online for the lecture. Thank you. Okay. So the question was, as I said it, there is a patient who has come to the emergency room of 25 year old male patient with complaining of palpitations. ECG is done by your nurse and then the nurse is like, oh my gosh, what is this rhythm? And then they call you up. So you, as soon as you arrive and you see this ECG. So what do you think? The blood pressure is like 100 by 60. I'm going to we, we, we all are going to go in step-by-step step approach and a little bit slow. So what is happening in this ECG? So what is happening in this ECG? What do you notice? I'll try to give you some hint. How do you describe an ECG? Rate, rhythm, axis, and is there any... P-wave abnormality, QRS abnormality, segment abnormality, and then the abnormal things. But simple, simple things first. Uh, do you see any bundle branch block? How about the axis? This is how you should go. So what do you notice in this? No one? I am surprised. What did we do in the first 30 minutes of the lecture? Okay. Normal sinus rhythm. Okay, right bundle branch block. Yes, that's a good start. Okay, what else do you notice? Hmm. Don't be afraid because right now is the time is for learning. Okay, you all are students right now. So if right now is the best time to make those mistakes. So that later on, in future, whenever the patient is not there, you will not be making those mistakes. Right now you are for learning. And more you interact, more you will learn. Dr. Ambu, please mute your microphone. Because I can still hear noise from that side. Patoli, Dr. Ambu Patoli. Yeah. Hmm, no answer. So there are so many of people and there's no one is giving an answer. Why is that so? How do you approach an ECG? Do you want me to take a lesson on session on ECG? Okay, rate is 150 per minute. So this is like a tachycardia, some tachycardia, right? Tachycardia with right bundle branch block. Okay. What else? Good, good. Dr. Sh Ashraf, I appreciate it. You're going in the good direction. Fine. 
See, learning is a very holy thing. And if during your learning stages, if you are not so serious, you will regret it throughout your life. If you're trying to sit in your clinic, trying to keep on, you know, divide your attention between your clinic and still trying to take a lesson, it's not like this. You are going to suffer and ultimately, Rajiv Nayan, please mute your microphone now. This is a problem with you guys. Huh? You are not even able to answer basic things. So what else? Yes, okay. Do you think it is left axis deviation? I'm asking, I'm not telling the answer. Okay, okay, okay. Think, 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 think. You're almost going in the direction, changing PI interval. Hmm. So if the PI interval continuously changes, are you able to see the P waves really well, Dr. Algan? I want it to be interactive. It, I don't want it to be a single-sided discussion. So what do you notice? So someone is finishing his lunch, Rajiv Narayan. I can hear the voice, huh? You finish your lunch, right? See, this is the problem. People like Rajiv Narayan, if you're going to have your lunch as well and if you're thinking to put it up together with the lecture, the problems happens like this. You will not be able to learn right now and later on as well, it will be difficult. So focus on one thing. So the question was, what do you see over here? On and off. Okay, good. Changing PI interval. So in simple thing, you can think it like this is, there is VA dissociation. Oh my gosh. Dr. Babita Babu. Please mute your microphone. I can hear sound from your side. So whosever microphone is on, I can always hear the person's name. You can see it on the screen. Okay. Try to participate in the session. I want the participation. So, okay, we are already reaching somewhere over here. So the varying PI interval, you are not able to see regular P waves related to the QRS. So what is it called as? So this is called as VA dissociation, right? So what else do you notice? So if we look carefully, the AVR, is it positive or negative? Come on, now no, no, you can be frank. AVR, this AVR, is it positive or negative? So this AVR is positive, right? And if we look carefully, so for example, over here we are able to notice a P wave. P, QRS, T is there as well. But after that, we don't see any P over here, right? So similarly, over here, in this other wave, we are able to see this P. So this is what is called as the VA dissociation, in fact. And if you look at, if you keep on looking at this QRS in a continuous way, what is happening? Over here, there is narrow QRS, right? This is white, narrow. This is again white. So this is what is called as a capture beat. Okay? And then similarly, if you keep on going around, keep on going around, what do you notice over here? First beat, second beat, third beat, fourth beat is slightly different. So the fourth beat is a little bit mixture of this and the narrow one. Isn't it? It is different. So this is what is called as a fusion beat. Similarly, even in this as well, when we keep on going, so sometimes you see the P wave, but sometimes you don't see the P wave. So this is what I had already said it. It is called as the AV dissociation. Isn't it? So, the other thing as I was telling you, so already this, there are various uh, features which this patient is having. So, as I already said, 
fusion wheat is there, capture wheat is there, avid association is there, in fact. Okay, RBV bundle branch block morphology is there, prominent R in AVI is there as well. And yes, the RD cardiac axis keeps changing, in fact. So this is definitely a fascicular VT. So ventricular tachycardia and the RBVB with left axis deviation. So this is more of a fascicular VT, posterior fascicular VT. And as I was telling you, the reasons, why do you call it as? Will you be able to remember this? Good, Dr. Algapan. After I mentioned everything, then you are writing it up. Good, good, but still, okay? So don't forget all these signs, which I already said it to you. The signs are very, very important. So, which I said, it, the fusion beats is there, the capture beat is there, every dissociation is there. And in fact, the atypical RPP morphology criteria, which we had already said it about the VT, right? So the V1 is not like triphasic, R-ish R. In fact, in the V6, R is smaller than the S wave. And the other criteria, as I had already said it as well, is you see the prominent R in AVR, which is called as, especially during the tachycardia. So what criteria is it called as? Varex criteria, right? Hmm? Okay. I am going to withdraw the answer from you guys only. Don't worry. So what do you see in this e chest x-ray? So <coughs> I also try to help you guys. So what is happening over here? Dr. Algan, Dr. Bansur. So what do you suggest? What is happening over here? Dr. Ashraf. So what is happening in this x-ray actually? If you look carefully, you will get the answer. I want you all to become masters in the ECG. That's why I'm trying to give you more time as well. So what happens is there are some catheters which is kept over here, right? So what is happening is, so this is the heart, of course, right? And the, so what view is it? LAO or RAO? What view is it? So if we see, the spine is on the right side of the screen, right? So this is RAO. It should be a lateral view. Sorry? What, 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 who, who said what? I didn't hear well. So, as I was telling you, so you can see the spine on the right side. So, this is the easy way. So, this is more of a right anterior oblique. And this RF catheter has been inserted in a retrograde way. Retrograde way means, as I was showing you that diagram. Do you all remember? The diagram which I had shown you, the construction schematic diagram to make you all understand. So, this is almost like that only. So, this is the left ventricle in which the catheter has been put up from above. And this is the radio frequency catheter. So you try to go inside and you will be able to try to notice in fact. Okay. And this is the RV catheter, the coronary sinus catheter which has already been taken out over here. Then, I am going to continue asking you questions. Okay. So some catheters has already been put. So now it is being manipulated. Okay. So now, you get this ECG. This is again the 12 lead ECG of the tachycardia. So now you have to tell me, what do you notice in this ECG? Who is going to tell me? So what is happening in this ECG? Come on, I already explained just few minutes back. This is like, I, I think the fourth time I'm asking the same question. The RI intervals are slightly irregular, right? And if you look carefully, there's again weird dissociation as well, right? 
and then there is right bundle branch block. V1 is positive, V6 is more of negative. This is small r, big S wave. B, VA dissociation is there. AVR is more of positive, right? Then axis as well. What do you notice? This is more of a left axis. Uh, one is kind of equiphasic, otherwise slightly more positive. Two is more of negative. So RB, VB, left axis deviation, VA dissociation. Hmm? With all these things, so this is more of a definitely a ventricular tachycardia and posterior fascicular VT. So this is the ECG. So then, since it seemed like a little bit difficult, so 3D mapping was activated. So different dots were put up. So what are these different dots now? You all have to tell me. I already said to you all once. So for example, tell me. What is this white dots? So what are these white dots which we see over here? So as I had said it, this is the anterior fascicle. Okay. And this is the area for the left bundle. Okay. And these... Uh, dots refer to the posterior fascicle in fact yeah and the blue dots are the ones where pre-perkinja potential was seen and the red ones where perkinja potentials were seen and the yellow over here was the ablation point the red dots is for the ablation point actually so as i already said it so if you look carefully in this diagram, so as I was telling you, white dots for the left posterior fascicle, pink dots for the left anterior fascicle, the orange dots for the his bundle, okay? And the blue dots for the location of the earliest fascicular potential during the fascicular VPCs. So, then what is being done is, the red dots tend to refer for the ablation where the left posterior fascicle with fascicular potentials was seen. So after, as I had said it, the step-by-step -step approach, after you have already gone over there, so we try to do was the entrainment. Entrainment was done with the ablation catheter and you could see over here when pacing was done, it the entrainment was good and of course it seemed to be in the same site. However, what had happened is activation mapping was not performed, especially during the fascicular VT as it was repeatedly getting terminated during the catheter manipulation near, near the left posterior septum. And therefore ablation was performed in the sinus rhythm by an atomical approach and the left anterior or posterior fascicle. And his cloud was, of course, mapped and tagged in the map, which I said it. And the target of the ablation was left posterior fascicle about midway between the his and the LV apex at the location of Purkinje potentials. So always remember, two P's are the important, where you see the Purkinje potentials. And uh, yes, wherever the entrainment was done, and that was the fascicular site, in fact. So this is what you notice over here. Okay, and there is AV dissociation and Purkinje potentials at the ablations which tends to precede the QRS by 14 milliseconds. So, okay, and this is the ECG. Finally, what do you notice in the ECG? There is no, see, so this is the post procedure ECG. So, whenever the ECG is there coming in front of you, so what will you notice is this is still a sinus rhythm in the sense there's no bundle branch block or no AV block, right? So because this is from the coronary sinus, this is the ventricle. A, V, A, V, A, V, A, V, A, V. So there's no VA block at all. There's no left bundle branch block as well. Did you notice? 
So are any then are there any questions so far? Tell me. Are there any questions so far? I hope, see why I try to do it like this was I try to 